Hey, I'm Jeff Keeley here in Boston to go behind the scenes to hear some untold stories about the making of Bioshock with Ken Levine and Sean Robertson. Let's talk a bit about the theme and setting of Bioshock, Rapture. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they played the game for the first time, Ken, they wondered, how did you even dream up this place? And I know you've said publicly before that part of the reason you sort of, what led you to Rapture was this idea of fully simulating a place. Uh, tell us about that sort of idea and the frustrations you had with other games where there, you sort of hit a bound. I think our philosophy is, was always to do what we were doing 100% rather than try to do something bigger and do it 50% or 40%. So one of the ideas of, you know, and this sort of came from System Shock 2 as well, where you focus on an area that you can really bring to life and you kind of eliminate the questions of, well, why can't I go over the bridge to New Jersey? So we were able to really make a place, I think, that felt believable and real, even though in actuality it was really quite limited. But we just sort of dressed it with all these buildings outside that were all, you know, they were all basically glorified fakes. We let the story drive what we needed to show rather than some kind of like predetermined map which we sat down, which is a little different than like System Shock 2 where we actually mapped a spaceship out deck by deck. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't know why the, the philosophy felt a little different there because you want to feel like a real spaceship that was, that was sort of stacked on top of each other. But Rapture was free to sprawl across the ocean floor. Although you guys originally, John, were talking about doing this game on a sort of spaceship again, right? Yeah, when we first started talking about what the spiritual successor to System Shock 2 is going to be. Spaceship came up, but again, you know, we, we wanted a limited environment and we didn't necessarily want to do Spaceship again. And our first actual exploration of this space was underwater, but ultimately ended up looking like a spaceship. It just happened to have a couple of you know, seaweed fronds out, outside. And that started to push us towards uh, what artistic statement that we wanted to make to make this look different and what rules we were going to set for the world. How, at every turn, we were going to try to remind the player that they were, in fact, underwater and that this wasn't a spaceship. And how, like, underwater, we obviously know you did underwater, then sitting in the sky, like, what, where did you come with the idea of, like, doing this underwater? I think there was probably a conversation. It's like, well, w what kind of places could be cut off from, from yeah. other places? Yeah. Like, well, you know, a spaceship, a summer camp, <laughs> uh, you know, like yeah. any island notion, right? Something that's cut off from the rest of the world. Yeah. So you never felt like you should be able to go over that bridge to New Jersey. I don't want to apply some deep and meaningful conversation. I think it was one of those ideas that you just kind of say, and then everybody, well, oh, that well, sounds cool. Let's try right, that. Let's, that. Let's let's right. go for it. And, and it, I think it lended itself to having very nice views out the window without having to build an insane amount of unique assets. Right. By today's standards, we still were a small team back then. And there's an expectation that because you're underwater, the view distances are going to be short. So you can really kind of fade out into the fog at a short distance and not have the expectation that, why can't I see forever? So there's a lot of limitations in a good way that we put on ourselves by, by being underwater, as opposed to like if you're on a cruise ship, then you'd expect to see across the water and we'd have to deal with that. Same thing with an island. Or in the outdoor sky. Where you're yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> Which was a lot more complicated. Yeah. yeah. So you, you came up with the idea of let's do this underwater, let's do this sort of isolated place. Then you had to answer the question of, you know, why would someone build this? Is that sort of how it worked, sort of order of operations? You then had to come up with a story to explain? Yeah, uh, it, I think the, we wanted a very believable reason why they'd be there. Right. And sort of the, the necessary isolation of, of the place sort of led to, well, what kind of person would want to do this? And um, I wasn't even particularly aware of the sort of political implications of what I was reading, but I've been reading, um, I had read The Fountainhead. Right. Um, by Ayn Rand, and I mostly thought it was an interesting story. Like, I didn't realize that people were sort of basing their sort of political totally. lives around it, because um, yeah. I wasn't that tuned in to that stuff at that point. And so, but I love the, the dialogue and the kind of speechifying in it, because you can see a video game character yeah. speaking with that kind of certainty and that kind of confident um, philosophy. It just seemed like a, a natural, a natural kind of thing to apply to, to this place, and so it just sort of all came together as a very, as a sort of a, a, a who is the guy who would do this? Well, right. 
you know, that character. Um, it was sort of this amalgamation of characters from Ayn Rand's books and Ayn Rand herself, this sort of idealistic person who says, well, the only way to do this is to separate from the rest of the world. Right. And that led to Andrew Ryan. I am Andrew Ryan, and I'm here to ask you a question. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow? No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. We knew from a technical standpoint that we wanted isolation. We also knew to sell it, we needed a compelling storyline, a backstory that why would this place exist? Otherwise, how are we going to make Rapture feel like it's lived in if we don't have the reason for it to be there. So w once, once we decided on the underwater location and then the closed off spaces, that objectivist story kind of came in and came in and made, and made the art stronger and made the level design stronger because we could feed back into that loop. And I think that's why we had to have sort of Andrew Ryan's pitch right at the beginning of the game. We wanted people to understand why somebody would go there. And so was, he makes this very personal one-to-one -one pitch to the gamer, but also that was the pitch he made to people, yeah. which was, you know, there's a place that you can be free of all these things, where you can not be sort of put upon by the government and not be afraid of nuclear war and not be afraid of all these other things that um, will plague you on the surface. And we wanted that pitch to sort of resonate and make sense because that's otherwise by the time you got there you'd be like well this place is just fantasy nobody would ever come here and that the beauty of the place also was also tied into that it had to be a very attractive proposition or people who would believe that people would go leave their lives and go to the bottom of the ocean i'm sure in some ways you had to convince the team and enroll them in your sort of vision of you know who this character was going to be and what the setting was going to be. How, how did that work, Sean? I mean, Ken come in and say, hey, I've been reading these books, and I think we could sort of... I believe he just came in one day on a, on a horse and said, <laughs> and ran, everybody read The Fountain. Exactly. I bought 30 uh, copies of <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, you there's know... A seven, there's a 2,000-page book or something. Yeah. Go, go read it. And it really is more organic. It, you know, like I said, we knew that we had this location, and you struggle to fill it with stories, and you struggle to find meaning of why... Why does this place exist? You know, what's my motivation? And as Ken started to explore Ayn Rand um, a little more and started talking to us about it, and we ha were having that conversation, and it's like, oh, this could totally work. Like, this is exciting. Like, this is something that really hasn't been done in a video game before. And if we had flipped it and come up with the idea first before the location, I don't think we would have really been that excited about it. But we had a location. And now we're trying to fill it with, with that story. And, and because of the order of operation there, you start to get excited. Like, oh, I could totally make this work. This, this, this is going to uh, really make it feel like a lived-in space. You know, as you think of sort of the, you know, the setting and you think of maybe a character or something, was there a moment that you, you think back? It's like, oh, like right then and there, like I, I got excited when you attached the For, for me, it was, go, it. it was going to Rockefeller Center yeah. um, and seeing the visual. Uh -huh. so I, you know, I told this story before, but I, my wife and I were in New York, and we went to Rockefeller Center, which was, if you go to Rockefeller Center, it basically looks exactly like Rapture. It's because yeah. every building, you're sort of encircled. It's this block in New York, or a couple of blocks in New York, where Radio City Music Hall is, and um, where 30 Rockefeller Plaza is, where you see that show 30 Rock, and the ice skating rink, and where they put the Christmas tree. And it's this very iconic location, but what's cool about it, it's all one, unlike the rest of the city, everywhere you look, it's one um, architectural style. It's Art Deco. And it's very iconic Art Deco. And my wife and I were there and we were sort of working on the game and we didn't have a visual style and all of a sudden I started looking around and I said, oh, oh this could be a visual for the game. Also, it was, the geometry of it was actually quite conducive to making a video game because it wasn't overly complicated geometry. Art Deco is quite bold and simple. Bold and geometric, yeah, and simple. And so my wife and I bought a couple of tourist cameras before, this was before iPhone right, cameras, exactly. you know. Throwaway cameras, yeah. Yeah, yeah throwaway cameras, yeah. little Kodak things, and we just started photographing doorknobs and light fixtures and just sort of brought, we, you know, developed the photos, remember that? Um, yeah. Brought them in and said, Tell like, the officers a stack of stuff, a stack Sean. of photos. Take a look. I'll see you guys in a couple of years. Go, go make this. city where the artist would not be in sense of where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of 
your brow, Rapture can become your city as well. So you had kind of a, a theme, you came up with an art style, some of the iconic characters, and then you know you really had to build the narrative around it. Um, and you've talked about you know a lot of the, the themes in the game and you know greed, jealousy, sex, violence, all the things that sort of you know drive us or what destroy us. And that was something I think that you know as you thought about the, the story of the game, you wanted to I'm sure reflect some of those, right? Because I think people love the characters that sort of flawed in a way, and this is a, a a world which is its own little microcosm, but had a lot of tension inside of it. Yeah, I mean, the character of Ryan was sort of, um, he, he's basically invisible through most of the game, right? You know, except for a very small portion. But he's very present because he exists, the city is him, right? You know, it's such a representation of him. We never want to cut away to a cutscene where you saw Andrew Ryan, you know, planning and scheming. We, we wanted him to be very present without actually being present. But once you had Ryan, and once you had his desire to protect this vision of his, you had a, you just had to then come up with the characters who'd be arrayed in opposition to him. So we had this character, the big daddy, and then eventually the character of the little sister. And so characters like Tenenbaum came along. Like, you know, here's a person who's in opposition to him for this reason. And then yeah. you have, you know, for more noble reasons. And then you have a character like Atlas, who's much more cynical yeah. opposition. Once we had all those characters arrayed, we're like, well, who are you? And, you know, you ended up being a sort of, you know, a pawn in the middle of this, of all this opposition to Ryan. We just kept kind of homing in on that theme and making you, making sure that you weren't, you know, eventually figuring out that you couldn't just be here by an accident, that you, that you're an integral part of what this story, even though you don't know you're an integral part of this story, you, you think you're just there by happenstance. Look, Mr. Bubbles, it's an angel. I can see light coming from his belly. Wait a minute, he's still breathing. It's all right. I know he'll be an angel soon. Bioshock was groundbreaking in many regards when it released in 2007, though fundamentally it shared many consistencies with the rational System Shock series. What elements of System Shock translated into Bioshock and what was refined, altered, and innovated upon to create the world of Rapture? Let's take a look at the long road from System Shock to Bioshock. Everyone knows where the game ended up, but uh, I think fans would be interested to learn where this game or, or the idea of doing this game started. And I think you know, folks know System Shock and the, the legacy of that game, huge fan base. Did this game, did it start as a System Shock game initially? No, I mean, okay. we, we didn't have, we didn't have the, the, right. the rights to that, yeah. right? We kind of felt that um, there was more game design to, to mine there, you know, that it was sort of, we did that one game and it was sort of the first game that really combined shooting and RPG and it was a very small budget, you know, it was a very small team and it was the first game we had ever done, so we got pretty lucky, I think, in terms of how well it came out, but, you know, but the odds are sort of stacked against it. And um, the team, you know, was really enthusiastic about doing a game like that you know, and time had evolved and the team was much more, we had done a bunch of games together and we were, you know, we had a stable technology base and we were like, okay, well, let's, which, the, which System Shock 2 was not. I mean, that engine, yeah. barely, no game had ever shipped on that engine. It was a very crude piece of technology. Most of us had never shipped a game at the time. So like, well, what if we had a stable technology base and we had a team that was more experienced and more seasoned and we had, you know, an actual, like our director and, you know, which we didn't really have on System Shock 2. You know what? What could we do? And so I think there was a lot of enthusiasm in the team to really try to do a more mature version of that kind of game. You know, we, this is before we had sold the company to Take Two, and we were an independent developer, right? We were sitting there. We were using the money we made from 
other development deals we had, and we would try to scrape together whatever time and money we had to work on this thing. And it was not actually something I was particularly keen on doing. The team was much more keen on doing a, a sort of a, a system shock-ish game than I was because- you're a pitcher, right? Like System Shock 3 at one point, right? Well, I, I mean, there was an actual System Shock right. 3 that we were pitching okay. back in the day when we were right after System Shock 2, but that never happened. Right, yeah. Um, they couldn't get couldn't get anybody interested because System Shock 2 sold like five copies, right? And so as the business guy, the guy who had to not only just sort of write the content, but the guy who had to go out and get the deals and pay everybody, I wasn't particularly excited about doing this because it was very disappointing when we did System Shock 2 and nobody bought it. You know, it got great reviews. It got these insane reviews, and but it left us in a place where we, we it didn't really move the needle for us in terms of making payroll. So I wasn't super excited about it because I didn't see how it, I didn't see a publisher be interested in it and I didn't see the audience actually being particularly interested in this kind of game. And it was really the team who convinced me to invest in this because their enthusiasm, I think a lot of them came to the studio because of System Shock 2. And so finally they, you know, they sort of battered me down and you know, it's good they did because I, 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 was, I was not the first fan of, of doing this. And I know initially there was something called the Serene Dawn. Was that that was a spaceship? The or what was a, that? No, that was the name of a cult, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. That one's I think been lost to the. If I remember correctly, Serene Dawn was a cult. You were playing as a deprogrammer that was infiltrating the cult, and your name happened to be Carlos Coelho, who was our one of our programmers yeah. at the time. Huh? It's named after him, yeah. Then there was a story notion that I always really found interesting, which was that you have these cults, and you have sometimes people who, they're these sort of characters who are really live on the edge of, of the gray morality, which is these guys who come in and essentially kidnap people out of these cults, or rescue them, depending on how you look at it. Because what you really, it really is, from a functional standpoint, it's a kidnapping, right? You're coming to an adult, and you're saying, you know, you're hired by their parents or whoever, and this was in the story, it was like a senator whose daughter was, joined one of these religious movements called the Serene, the Serene Dawn, you said? Yeah, yeah Serene, Serene Dawn. Dawn. And, and, and I always thought that was a really interesting tension of yeah. this hero who's basically a kidnapper and taking a young woman against her will out of the place that she was in. Now, you could ar also make the other argument that well, she was not really there by her will. But there's a really interesting conversation that goes on there. I think there was actually a Kate Winslet movie, a Harvey Keitel Kate Winslet movie, which dealt with a similar theme. Because uh -huh. um, usually you hear that story, you know, these, de these deprogrammers as a sort of heroic kind of notion. But I always thought that, well, there's something, something interesting about agency going on there and about who's, are people entitled to make bad mistakes? Or, you know, or is it a bad mistake? It all depends on the person. You know, and I'm not a fan of, you know, religious cults or religion in general, but it, it, there seemed to be an interesting uh, discussion of, of freedom there and, and independent decision making. And I, I thought that idea was cool, and, um, and that was sort of the basis of it for a while, but it was really mostly for the purpose of we needed something to go out and pitch to publishers, yeah. and so we know we didn't have a ton of time to really develop it, so that sounded like, all right, this will do for now. And was that, was that pre-Underwater City? I mean, this was just like an idea for a story? We may have stepped away from that to do the cult thing, but then we went back to the, to the Underwater no, thing. We had that one room, remember? We had the one World War II room with the um, roaches on the ground and like these weird test tube things that you could walk around. I, yeah, I don't know where that fell. It could have been Underwater. There was no windows. <laughs> the, thing is, the thing is, we were a small business, right? And we were trying to like figure out a way to sell this thing with, the, with spending the least amount of money because we didn't have any money. We, yeah. we, we don't have a pot to piss in. So we would do this demo that was one room, basically, just to show. And I'd write up a document. And we'd take it around. I'd fly yeah. around the country be like, here's our room. Uh, it was a different time, you know? Yeah. And, and we had um, just come off of uh, SWAT 4. One of the advantages we had is that we were so familiar with that engine at that point that we could really start cranking through you know small rooms and lighting and, and making things look good so so I took it on the road yeah. to sell it to somebody and nobody cared we'd go to a publisher and look they have to make money right and then we'd say and, they, and we say oh it's sort of a spiritual successor to system shock too and they'd be like well how did that sell and I'd be like my mom likes it you know yeah. um, and they would be like well we can't you know and usually we'd be talking to a fan a lot of 
executives, like sort of junior executives, were fans of System Shock, and they re and they go to their boss and they'd be super excited, and their boss would open up, you know, their Excel spreadsheet and be like, "No, we can't do this." And we, I think the pitch probably evolved as we kept trying different permutations trying to sell, but we we're also out there trying to sell like two or three other things at the time. We had a pitch for a game called Monster Island, and uh, yeah. well, our SWAT five pitch. Was, oh, the, oh, zombie SWAT. Yeah, we, we had just come off of SWAT 4, which is like hardcore tactical, and we decided they wanted us to do another SWAT, and we didn't really want to do another hardcore tactical game, so we're like, what if we added zombies to SWAT? Like, this you're is a SWAT team that fights zombies and werewolves. That sounds awesome. And it was like, no, it doesn't. And this is before, this is <laughs> we're like not before zombies were a thing. Yeah. We were, yeah. And so we came up with this thing called Division 9. Division 9, yeah. That probably would have been even a bigger financial success than, than Bioshock, wow. but we couldn't get anybody interested in it. Um, we didn't have enough werewolves in the demo, I think. We had zero werewolves yeah. in the demo. Yeah, we were going to have werewolves, weren't we? Werewolves and vampires. So it's <laughs> oh, whole, really? Yeah. Yeah. Werewolves and vampires, like, zombies? Just that's throw it all, yeah. all the Universal Studios monsters from like... <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so what happened was is we couldn't sell it, but we were always sort of independent minded and so I said well what if we sort of did this in reverse instead of getting a publisher first and then going doing a press tour on it what if we sort of did the press first yeah. and we called up a guy Andrew Park at uh, who's a game spot at the time who was a fan of System Shock 2 and a, and a great guy and he was I said well, will you come out and look at this thing we're doing and write a story on it and he was like sure and Andrew flew out and we showed him what we had which is this very you know yeah very rudimentary thing about an underwater base and he wrote up an article and sort of featured it as like this is the spiritual successor to System Shock 2 and the next day the phone started ringing from publishers who now all of a sudden saw that the article was getting all this pickup and all these comments and people were excited and that really I think put it over the top in terms of being able to sell it even though it was not Bioshock at that point. It was called Bioshock, but it was yeah. not Bioshock. It, it, there would have been no, I don't think there would have been a game, we never would have sold it without Andrew coming out doing that. My belly's full of angels, blood. One of the biggest challenges Irrational faced when developing Bioshock was figuring out a way to retain the feeling of a deep RPG while making the game accessible to a broader console audience. Ultimately, the team succeeded in creating an intricate system of weapon and character upgrades that gave the player choice and customization while keeping the gameplay fast, lean, and engaging. One of the hallmarks of Bioshock to me at least, was that it, it really blended RPG and sort of first-person action game together in a way that, you know, is, is sort of standard today, but a decade ago was, was really pretty revolutionary. And I know for the team, I think at some point it became clear that you wanted this to work on consoles, not on PC, right? Well, both, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so the idea of, you know, doing a console game and a PC, a PC game and doing something that sort of felt like a shooter but had much more depth. And I know in, in some of the early design docs you talked about sort of creating an FPS plus versus an RPG light. What was the difference in your mind between those two? I think for us is the game of the big difference between System Shock and Bioshock ended up being that System Shock was more about your character growth and Bioshock was more about the environment. Because with System Shock, we really didn't have System Shock 2. We didn't really have the either the art team to make enough assets or the visual power to sort of make a, comp a really convincing environment. But as we started working on Bioshock, the art team was so strong that the ability to tell story within the environment became the most important thing about the game. And that was sort of not something we thought right at the beginning. That was not really a concept we had. But as we started building things, we could realize that the visual world was the star of this thing. The rapture was really the star of this thing. And telling the story outside of cutscenes, telling it in the world, so the gamer could ex discover the story rather than us telling him the story, telling him or her the story. And it was still very much for the time, oh, I think for the time, quite different than what you had seen in terms of there wasn't a lot of growth in shooters. So right. it was still, I think, for the time, very, very revolutionary. But I think System Shock 2 was even more ahead of its time in terms of, of that growth thing um, because we defocused a little bit. Primarily, part of it was just figuring out how to do that all on a console controller was, was very tricky.
No, I mean, even the early demos, people were like, you know, you see a plasma, you see like an upgraded weapon, people like, oh, I've never seen that before in a shooter. And that was, you know, when you were coming out of the sort of, you know, the Quake, Doom, Half-Life, where it's like you have, you know, eight weapons on the keyboard and you sort of knew what they were and they weren't going to change. Yeah. Sean, was that something that, you know, from a sort of creative standpoint, was it always clear that that was something you guys wanted to do or it evolved over time because you wanted to have more depth in the game? I mean, it certainly evolved over time and each, you know, upgrade path was slightly, you know, had its own unique challenges. Like certainly upgrading the weapons, you had to design a base weapon that didn't feel like crap still felt like something that you wanted to use, but then the ability to add the upgrades to, to that, and each of the upgrades could come in any order, so you have to be aware that this, you know, parts A, B, and C could come in at any different time to upgrade the weapon. In a first-person shooter, that's your star. That's the thing that you're seeing all the time. When it comes to other things, plasmids, uh, things that are, you know... Tonics. Tonics, yes, sorry. It's been a while. Come on, Sean. <laughs> I know, it's ten years. Those things were more offloaded to machines that you would then have to interact with so you're not carrying the inventory around with you. But each, each of these decisions on you know, how we're going to upgrade the player, you know, it wasn't like a mouse and keyboard, okay, we can just use the mouse and you have all these buttons at your disposal. You could arbitrarily point at a part of the screen really yeah. easily, which you could do in System Shock too. Yeah, so we certainly you know, learned trial by fire when we were trying to adapt these things to the console at the time. Yeah, and like having you know different ammo types and stuff like that. Like we went through numerous, numerous iterations of the interface to make it. I, like we had the first times when we sort of put the interface into play, it was very obtuse and very tricky to get your head around. And we just kept working on it and working on it and working on it because you want to feel like second nature. And but that was we spent a lot of time on that. What motivated the idea of having uh, so much choice in the way you could sort of play through this game? What was it to you know give the player a, a better sense of authorship over the experience, or what, what was driving that? I've always liked the idea of giving the player a lot of agency in terms of their play style yeah. and experimenting with the play style and trying different things and seeing what worked and didn't work and interacting with the environment. The notion that it's sort of a playground that you get to play around with and, and imprint your own desire on was great because I think we were more skeptical about being able to do that with story at the time. In fact, so much to the point where that become almost like a joke, you know, that becomes the meta joke of the game of how little agency you have in, in, in your story. But agency in terms of how you play the experience and how you load out your weapons and how you interact with the environment. As compared to most shooters at the time where basically like you can shoot them with a the shotgun or shoot them with the, you know, the pistol. That was really important to us. So we spent a lot of time trying to make the game, the world react in a way that you would expect and hope it to react when you tried something. Right. And some of those system or decisions we made about systems fed back into the narrative, like locking Adam behind the big daddy and the little sister, like you can't get at him unless you deal with the Big Daddy, which then becomes a roving boss fight, which then becomes another system that, I don't know if we planned that from the start or was one of those happy, like, you know, serendipity, like, oh, this decision that we made about putting Adam behind the Big Daddy totally works because now we have a different type of boss fight that we hadn't really seen uh, actually, in other games. Actually, it was, bad. it was the other way because what happened was is, Originally, there was no concept of Adam, and Big Daddy just had money and other treasure on them, like every other splicer. Yeah. And they were so tough, nobody would ever fight them, because why on earth would yeah. you go after that guy? Right, go off a bunch of small splicers and get the same amount. Yeah. So we had to come up with a, a currency that was exclusive to them, because yeah. we knew that was where the fun was, right? But we also knew people were terrified of them, and we didn't want to fight right. them. Yeah. So game, video game development and system development is a lot like economics, right? You know, in economics, you try to encourage certain behaviors through tax, usually through tax policy. You know, well, you want business growth, so you lower taxes on, on certain segments of the business economy, or you want to encourage, you know, people to move into this area, so you make incentives to move in here. We had to make an incentive for players to fight the big daddy, and Adam became that incentive. And then, once you had this Adam, then you had a new piece of narrative, which you they could then incorporate back into the story. Yeah. Talk a bit about the the 
plasmids and the vending machines and that sort of whole approach to, I guess, what is kind of a tech tree, but, you know, and, and coming from PC games, you know, used to strategy games and whatnot with very complicated ways of how you would upgrade things. I thought you guys did a, a really interest, you had a really interesting approach to how you made it very accessible to a console audience. How did that evolve? Was like, did you know the vending machines were going to be there from the get-go? Well, we had vending machines in System Shock 2, so we were sort of lifting that, and I always thought that was a fun, um, it was a fun notion to, because it's a, it's a affordance that people already understand, you know, they see a machine, a vending machine, they know immediately, oh, that's where I buy stuff, right? Yeah. And you also then have to have a shopkeep. When we talked about wanting to make things, put limitations on ourselves so things felt fully believable, yeah. if we had a shopkeeper sitting there, you can't shoot him, he right. sits there, he doesn't say anything. Right. And all of a sudden, he feels fake. Where a vending machine, the Circus of Values machine, can feel 100% authentic, you know, despite the fact that it's selling like ammo and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, which is, you but know. But in an objectivist society where you don't have rules and regulations right. on you that have type that of thing, it, it feeds back into the narrative. But you don't then break the fiction at all by having these characters who sort of don't really live and breathe in the world. So the vending machines became an important part of that. But we still want to give them character, and hence the, you know, and so. That clown image came from a piece of, um, that image is actually from like a, a fruit container or something uh -huh. from like the 1940s. Okay. And so we had a book of like royalty free images and I saw that image and I'm like, let's call, let's put that clown on and we'll call it Circus of Values. And then, you know, we wrote a line, some lines for it, decided he'd be this sort of asshole clown. And then, um, then we hired the best actor in the world uh -huh. to play that part. That was, that was me. Uh, <laughs> well, and I cost the, my biggest Avengers. I didn't cost anything. Um, I didn't know you were really. That's I was a clown. Yeah. No, I was a clown. Um, I hear it in my head every day. Uh, my wife hates that voice. She <laughs> hates that voice. You can give us a little of it right here. Come. Welcome to the Circus of Values. She does not allow me to do that, so oh, I okay. do it outside of the house. Okay. But it, it allowed us to. It allowed us to have something that felt very rich and very real, while being very limited at the same time. And also, you know, the plasmids and sort of the motif of sort of the videos and how you explain sort of what a plasma was, that was a really fun way, I thought, to sort of explain that. Sean, how did you guys evolve that? Because it was a very art Again, artistic I think, approach. I think those came on pretty late, too, because we, you know, we were developing all these systems and you make the assumptions because you're dealing with them every day that the player who gets this game is going to understand what these systems are. And you know, we always joke that you can't ship a developer with a game or you can't expect somebody to have a readme file for all of these things. Nobody's understanding what these plasmids are or how to use them. How do we present these to the audience in, in such a way that they're going to understand what it is fictionally and what it is functionally? It feels Rob Waters did a lot of the, the animations on those. And we sit down and we, you know, write out like a little 30-second commercial of what this thing is. And again, because going back to the narrative, this is what would happen in Rapture. People are trying to sell these things, so they would come up with commercials to explain why you need this. Using that as, as your framework, you can then come up with all of these you know, little, little gags that people will remember to have a little personality to them, but I think ultimately in the end weren't that expensive to, no, to we, create because they're cheap. I think the, one of the most important things about it is we sent we, we didn't want them to be long and we didn't have a lot of budget for the arts. So we had like a couple of frames of animation yeah. in them essentially. And so we had to figure out how do we message how this thing works in like that. And, and that's what marketing is, right? You know, it's how do you message what, how something works. And marketing and tutorializing are very similar things, right? You're trying to get a message across in a very brief period of time in a very snappy fashion. And I think that one of the things that I, I always felt about games is that tutorials are sort of death. And because they're usually like, you know, the, you go into a scene and there's like a, tra a shooting range or something like that and you narratively they never really make sense oh, either and they're so boring yeah. and so we always try to put a big burden on ourselves of, of how do we train people while not letting them know they're being trained and brevity is really important to that so we sort of we had a bunch of art constraints on that which also led to a bunch of writing constraints and so those things were like I don't even know if they were 30 seconds yeah, they were like really short seconds. yeah like 15 seconds long we had to explain a whole plasmid in that period of time yeah. and I think that was a good exercise because it also made the game it forced us to be concise and to really explain what this thing was like that throw objects at foes you can even catch grenades and throw them back
Nailing the perfect marriage of story to gameplay is a science that many developers still struggle with today. Bioshock has left an indelible mark on gaming narrative that can be seen and felt in many modern releases, but Irrational's motto remained from the beginning, don't start with the story, start with the gameplay. A lot of fans probably wonder about the process you go through in writing the story and the design for a game like Bioshock. You've talked about how you know it evolves over time and what eventually ships is very different than your initial vision. Do you guys write like a script or a design document for the game and that becomes sort of the Bible that everyone drives towards or, or do you iterate much more? It's different for every game. Like System Shock 2, I wrote I, you know, I went back to it recently. I wrote a design document and like we started that project in September and the design document I saw was dated like October or something. So like in a month, like I wrote the design document and it, it didn't change. A lot of it, you know, got expanded upon, but the basic design really didn't change on that. Where on, where on Bioshock, I think it evolved in real time much more. Like the, we had a pretty substantial design shift like a year before the ship date. For Bioshock? Um, Bioshock, yeah. It, it got to be much more about the experience of being in Rapture than about being in your character sheet. And so the game evolved more towards that experiential kind of thing and making sure every idea was expressed in the world as well as just on your character sheet. So before you'd have a lot of things like, oh, I'm doing fire damage or electrical damage, but that was sort of a number flying off ahead versus, you know, the whole notion of like, you know, uh, you there's barrels and you light them on fire and then you can pick them up and throw them. But you'd have stats coming off characters and all that yeah, stuff. Much more so. Oh really? Huh. And that evolved, you know, sort of we did a, a design shift, but I don't know how well that got documented. I think we were moving so fast yeah. that it just we were just sort of changing things, you know, you know, rain down the laying down the tracks as we went right ahead of us. And the same with the screenplay, you know, the screenplay. The screenplay is a there is no screenplay. It's a yeah. bunch of you know, probably Excel files and fragments of Word documents that I'd write and I'd go to recording sessions and I'd rewrite on the fly once I hear the actor perform. Because once the actor takes on it, you listen to their voice and you say, you know, what you wrote doesn't really matter. Like, what is this guy's, what is the right thing for this actor playing this role to be saying? So I tend to do a lot of rewriting in the session. And then like you have a bug late at night where somebody says, oh, this doesn't make any sense. And you're like, oh God, and you have to write a new audio log and try to get the actor back in. Or you figure out, how do, what's the best way to get this idea across? Yeah. And is it an audio log? Is it a poster on the wall? Is, yeah. it, is it a piece of text that pops up on the screen? You know, and that's always depending on how much time you have and what actor availability is. So, you know, the plans sort of fall apart. Um, I think we've, we've worked on that a bunch since on the new project we're working on where, you know, we're, we are trying to document things a lot better and, and keep things a lot more logical. But the train was running so fast on Bioshock that we just sort of... I mean, early on we got the, the Andrew Ryan scene in, like we'd said before, and that was kind of like the keystone. Like, we're going to put a lot of work into this, so this can't change. Everything that happens before or after that don't really involve a lot of departments working together to make a scene, those things are very malleable. And if you need to change audio logs to represent a story, if you need to add lines or take away lines, it's that's very doable, and I think for a while we even had like text to speech. We even did that, in, I remember for Infinite with Booker and Elizabeth and all their dialogue, yeah. and that really didn't work very well because you'd have these dramatic scenes, and it'd be like, Elizabeth, do you need? Do we need to go to Comstock? And it, it just, yeah, just it, it, At some it, point it, was, it almost fall had no apart, value yeah, as far yeah. as I was concerned. <laughs> You're looking for an invite to the fisheries. Nuts, I say. But if in your head's up to the Wharf Master's office and find old Peach a research camera, maybe I could manage an invite. Ken has so much of, you know, these games in his head, and you're sort of, you know, you can keep it all straight or try to with all the different things and changes. But from the team perspective, Sean, I mean, how, because this is evolving and Ken's thinking his head about how this all ties together, um, how does the team sort of keep up with, you know, w what the whole game is going to look like? There's a lot of specifics that can change. For instance, um, Atlas used to have a southern drawl. Right. And then, you know, we, we recast to uh, the Irish. And we, 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 actually, we actually cast an actor, wrote the lines, uh -huh. did the whole thing, and realized that people hated that character and distrusted him from the first start. So we had to rewrite him, recast him, redo everything. Yeah. From a team perspective, 
you kind of get a sense on which things are going to be really volatile and that you probably want to push off till later because if you work on it now it might change. Larger themes don't tend to change too much, meaning we knew we were in Rapture, we knew we had big daddies, we knew we had little sisters, we knew we had splicers, we knew what the arc of the story was about Jack coming into Rapture and the, the specifics of this radio log versus that radio log didn't really affect anyone outside the, the audio team at that time because we could still build the environment. We still knew what the environment was. We still knew what the animations were. There are areas you learn just by working in the same space for a while that this, this scene, I'm not touching this yet because I know that it, it's, it's going to get changed a lot. I think these themes are pretty nailed down, so I'm going to focus the team on, on getting these things done. I won't leave you twisting in the wind. We're going to need to draw at a height, but you're going to have to trust me. The audio logs were you know, a great part of the game and something that if you're a true fan, I mean, people really go in, go in and listen to those and piece that all together. But I imagine there's a lot of work that goes into deciding, you know, well, this, this is better for an audio log versus game dialogue. And, you know, there's the act of sort of cutting back and sort of saying, you know, we need to be clear about what the narrative is for the game. What was that process like? I mean, the audio logs, were there things you added at the end or were those, you know, ideas that you had for the game but then said, hey, maybe we'd demote these a little bit and make them audio logs? As Sean was saying, there's sort of a hierarchy of expense that yeah. you, you have to face, and so any ideas you have to get across, especially as you start playing the game, you realize, well, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense. You have to figure out how you can introduce that idea. And generally, as the train is moving, you try to think of cheaper and cheaper ways to get those ideas across. If it's less important, it goes to an audio log. If it's less important, it goes to a poster on the wall. Um, well, there's also characters that you can bring in that have audio logs that aren't, you know, Atlas, Tenenbaum, those are your big ones. Uh, you can bring in somebody to do a short, you know, a few different audio logs. It's a character that some players may not even find, but right. it adds a little bit of depth to, to Rapture. Um, and, and, and it also, like, usually characters, each character generally is a, about a certain idea. And they're not, we don't just sort of come up with characters, like we have an idea problem that we right. need to solve. And so let's introduce a character who, who's this guy, yeah. and he will be the guy who sort of shepherds you through that, uh, that idea. Julie, my dear, I am trying to run a business here. You want to spend time with my honeybees? Well, I'm going to have to start charging you for the pleasure. If I come out one more time and find you lolling out there amongst my hives, I'm grabbing my shotgun. As to your question, yes, my days in beekeeping school are a blur. But I do seem to remember something about that enzyme you keep blabbing on about. So as you're going through the game and you know writing things, rewriting things, were there things with the original Bioshock that you you've always been surprised that more people didn't pick up on, or was there something that you know a, a connection to a character you thought was really going to resonate with people, which you know didn't, anything like that? No, it's the opposite. Okay. Um, I was amazed. I don't know how you felt, but I was amazed how many people connected to the Would You Kindly yeah. stuff, like yeah. because I think it was a real when I wrote that speech. I don't think anybody on the team was like, oh my god, this is like really this or that. And I don't think I really had any sense that people were going to connect to it. I think we ended up sort of over time finding more ways to support the notion throughout the game. Yep. Um, and I don't think I really, f until I heard Pat put together the 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 revelation moment, you know, yeah. where it's like, you know, where you had all the bits that Atlas had said to you uh -huh. in the past building up, and then there was a visual that went along with that. That's when I realized it was going to be a really powerful moment. But even so, I still was... That I think people are really going to connect to it or really even understand it because it's pretty out there. Um, yeah. And that it was meta commentary too. I think that completely, like, I think I thought, like, oh, it's kind of meta, cool. And but people connected to it in a much bigger oh, way. Yeah, the choice and understanding and also just, you know, being able to kind of roll back and think of all those other moments throughout the game. And so, you know, yeah. a great revelation like that, they're few and far between in games where you sort of like, then you want to play it again, you're just like, oh wow, really, that does all make sense, right? Yeah, I mean, I think as a team, we were definitely proud of what we had done. But at, up till that point, you know, SWAT 4 was the biggest game that we worked on, and we had no expectation of that anybody would pick this up. Or even like Bioshock cosplay, I remember the first cosplay I saw with a guy in the big daddy suit, and his little daughter was in the kitchen cabinet. I think that was the first one I saw. I was like, whoa, people 
know this stuff, that's insane. Yeah, people were building these outfits, and you know, and that's only that only expanded with with Infinite. I mean, that sort of went crazy with Infinite, yeah. with people cosplaying Elizabeth and Lutesses and Booker. It meant a lot of pe to people, and I, I I don't think that's something we ever saw coming, and we're deeply you know we're deeply grateful for it because it's one thing to make a game and get good reviews and, and stuff like that. It's another thing to have things that people are having their th weddings themed around it, uh, and their yeah. and their tattoos and naming their children after characters. You can't plan for that. And I think the only way that could happen is if you know you just make something that's something that you're deeply in love with and passionate about. We, right. I can say we were. It was something we were, there's a lot of passion on the team about. But we, we didn't know people were gonna no. take away what they did. Would you kindly? Would you kindly? Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Part of the challenge with that, though, is when people love fiction so much and they dive into you know every word written in every audi audio log and try and connect all the fiction, make sure it all makes sense. Are there any things from that game that you sort of look back and say, like, oh, wow, like we didn't explain this and we should have, or things that fans have misinterpreted over the years? There are things we think that we should that we did that should have or shouldn't have been in the game. Like I, I, I was never a fan of having two endings, and the I think that's where the publisher was asking you to sort of have a. That was the right? one thing that Two K, and they were very hands off. That was the one thing they insisted on, and I, I it's not something I really thought was a good idea because they're still limited, even though they're multiple, they're right. still limited. And so that was something that we ended up doing. One of the endings was far better than the other one. I mean, there's no, there's no, it's clear that I was much more interested in the happier ending with the Little Sisters than I was with the nuclear submarine that was, ending. I'm yeah. sure part of it was the idea that, you know, if this game is, if you're making a choice throughout it, I'm sure when some old people are like, oh, well then there has to, it has to be a, a payoff, right? Right, except the game was really about Exactly. Lack of choice, choice. Yeah, yeah, right. not being yeah. a choice. So, exactly. so yeah. that, that always struck me as a tension that was weird. But you know, look at the end of the day, they were putting up a lot of money, and right. you know, so I, I can't really complain. They weren't dictatorial at all during the development. So yeah, that was the one thing. But I, that's a game that I wouldn't have put the boss battle in the final boss battle. Like <laughs> we, we seem to end up doing that over and over and over again. Every time we start a project, I'm like, I'm never going to do that again. We're never going to do that again, and we end up doing it. Right. We're not good at boss battles, and that you know you're fighting that guy, and look, this is yeah. the naked dude. It, it just it yeah. just doesn't work. Totally makes sense. Uh, but um, and it works really pretty well up till then, but then it it doesn't it just doesn't yeah. work. That boss battle's silly. Rapture is filled corner to corner with detail and history, and the cast of characters that occupy this world are no less dynamic. Every splicer, every level boss has a story. In many ways, these characters are a reflection of their environment, and their environment, a reflection of their character. Let's talk about some of the characters in Bioshock. There's so many that fans love and there are many Wikia pages about them. You know, one thing that I think a lot of fans may not realize is you were telling stories with these characters, you know, a decade ago. And technology today, as we saw in, you know, a game like Infinite, you can do amazing things with facial expressions and storytelling. Conveying that emotion that you did 10 years ago with limited technology was challenging. How hard was it back in the day to sort of, you know, convey story in engine? We had such a small team that, you know, we had to show Tenenbaum or Atlas. They were just splicer models, right? Yeah. Oh, really? Tenenbaum was Lady Smith, yeah. which is there. There's a reason that she's in shadow behind glass, and it's not to be dramatic. It's because we couldn't afford to build another. Really? Yeah. So we, just uh, something as simple as that, like you couldn't afford to build. A we, model. We, we didn't have the. Yeah, we we there, we, there we were didn't have the, had a few uh, character models in the game. There's the what, maybe eight or nine character models. Character model, really? Yeah. Wow. So we're like, oh, we'll put her in silhouette behind a light, and people think it's. Noir and so much of it was driven by the the voice performance. I feel like yes. too, because I mean that it all had to. It was like a radio play in many ways. Still, yeah, we had some really good actors, and I was able to spend a lot of time with them. And the fact that I could write the stuff, direct it, and then rewrite in the room, and the fact that we had actors who were, for whatever reason, you know, I, I, I wasn't even in the same room as them. I was on a speakerphone. Right. They were in a studio in New York or L.A. or something. I never met. I don't think I met any of them. Really. Uh, None of the actors in Bioshock you ever met in person when you were making the game? 
maybe since, but at wow. the time I hadn't met a single one of them. That's except maybe a couple people like, you know, I played the Circus of Hours thing. Nate Wells played the uh, the, the Jack on the tr on the plane. You know, uh -huh. a couple of people in the studio. It was community theater. You know, in terms of the the tech and the sort of time we had for it, but the actors were. You know, we had some and exceptional actors. I will say, as as you know, doing animation on that game, that you can hide bad animation behind really good audio and it makes the animation look better. We didn't have a tech animator, it was me. I'd never rigged characters before and I'm, now I'm rigging characters trying to figure out how, you know, to get all these characters out right, to style. the animation team. So we're very limited when it came to animation tools. Yeah, Since apologize did, to my the, animators. No, but yeah. you did the big, I mean, for your, your first game that you rigged the Big Daddy, which is, yeah. you know, it's not an easy character to rig. It was, you know, we figured it out, but the tools that we had on Infinite were not the tools that we had on Bioshock. So you, you, we figured out what we could do and what we could do well and, and tried to hide, kind of, you know, put into the darkness the things that we knew we couldn't do very well. And having voice actors of that caliber that can bring those characters to life, you tend to fill in the blanks. So tell me, friend, which one of the bitches sent you? The KGB wolf or the CIA general? Here's the news. Rapture isn't some sunken ship for you to plunder. And Andrew Ryan isn't a giddy socialite who can be strapped around by government muscle. And you did get to revisit Rapture in the DLC for Infinite and you know with today's technology or technology from a few years ago, it, I'm sure it was liberating for you guys in some ways to be able to, to use that tech to bring the environment and also characters to life. What was that experience like for you guys to go back and sort of revisit Rapture? It was liberating because we got to revisit it, but we also, I think when we started, thought we'd be able to go reuse some of the old assets <laughs> and they just didn't hold up anymore right. compared to the infinite assets. So we basically had to rebuild, not just rebuild everything from scratch, we had to reimagine it from scratch yeah. because you know it, it, we had the ability to make it look grander and bigger but still feel like exactly like rapture it is a different kind of we're making a different kind of experience than, than bioshock one so it was tricky to find to make it feel like it was the same kind of game because uh, it wasn't you know the first one was sort of an action game the second one was really a stealth game um you know the barrel sea part two was really a stealth game and you're really telling the story of elizabeth throughout those things yeah. so it was a different lens but it was also cool because it allowed me to make the whole story about Elizabeth, you know, to have her be central to the, the franchise from the very beginning. And she was always, you know, she became the heart of it to me. And to have her, it was really exciting for me to make her, you know, her heroism be something that set the events of Bioshock into motion, which eventually, you know, saves all the little sisters. That was, that was really gratifying, a nice way to tie the whole thing up for me. And you probably didn't have that idea 10 years ago, right? You had to yeah. retrofit it all. I have no he, idea. He has Are a letter that he's addressed to himself that's 10 years old. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. We'll... I mean, for me, it was, it, was a, it was a nice way for me to say goodbye to Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. Because, you know, those two worlds together. You know, you don't realize, or I don't think the audience realizes how much time you spend with these characters trying to get them out and polished and, and into the world. And, it was a good opportunity, I think, as a game developer to kind of have that little coda at the end where you're like, okay, I, I get to, now I'm ready to move on to the next thing. I've had a nice, you know, break. Like, let, right. let's, let's seal this off and now, now I'm on to the next thing. And it was like 12 years of our lives, too. Between, yeah. Between the, a, the very beginning of it and it was a long time. Well, I mean, so my daughter, who is 16 now, I did a lot of filming of her when she was... Oh yeah, six as a little sister, oh, wow. and this was, it was not mocap. It's just running around the office, and I'm like trying to be like, um, now trip over the thing and pretend you die, or like <laughs> you know, like trying to like not like Drink traumatize a six-year-old. Yeah, pretend you're drinking something, and you know, and I never showed her the actual game until much later. But she, uh, on BSI, I used her. I put her in a mocap suit, and actually used her for the little sister. Oh, wow in Paris uh -huh. that's running after the balloon. So that was kind of, for me, like a nice... That's way to connect it all yeah. together. Were there any characters on the original game that you found hardest to write? I mean, you mentioned like, you know, recasting Atlas, things like that, but was there a character that was ch the most challenging for you, Ken? Well, Atlas, because, you know, he was basically written completely twice. That was very, very tough. And I was very happy about the original character, and I thought I'd really done something great. And then you showed it to people, and they just hated it and they didn't trust him. And if they didn't trust him, we were screwed. Yeah. 
And so it was tough because we, um, after having gone through all the recording to actually have to let the actor go, it's no fault of his own, right? right. That's, it was on us. He, he had invested in it, tell him that it wasn't going to happen and rewrite it from scratch. That was hard and that was, that was tough. And then after I finished it, I had a debate with somebody on the team who felt the accent was really, really phony. And we had an English person on the team and he felt the accent was really, really phony. So at the last minute, we basically ended up doing a focus test in, in Ireland right. um, well. to see if people bought the accent. Because actually the actor playing Atlas was Irish, uh -huh. but he was from a different part of Ireland, so he was uh -huh. playing a different kind of Irish accent. Right. Um, I don't think he was from Dublin, and Atlas sort of had a Dublin accent. And so at the last minute, I thought I was going to have to do it again. Oh, wow. And fortunately, the focus test came back, um, and, wow. it, and people loved it. I don't know how you survived that plane crash, but I've never been one to question Providence. I'm Atlas, and I aim to keep you alive. And a lot of the villains in the game felt like they were, you know, very much tied to certain levels, and this was, you know, you were still in an environment of levels with Bioshock, right? It wasn't just a big open world. Did that all sort of get designed together? It's like, here's the best villain that's going to fit to this environment and this theme of, you know, this area? Some of them work better than others. I mean, I think obviously Steinman, like Steinman and especially Sandra Cohen really, I think, dominate in terms of the level they, boss. They are the levels. Yeah. They are the levels. And, and some of the characters didn't hold up as well, I don't think, um, on the writing side. The fun thing about the characters at work, like Steinman, where he had all those little displays with the scissors and the tech, you know, like that was stuff the art team came up with to support that character. And obviously Sandra Cohen in that level, you know, I had this idea for this character and you know, as this artist and, and taking Andrew Ryan's thinking to the extreme, you know, uh -huh. through a lens of art was really fun. They really, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're like more like Batman villains than they are like actual, you know, real world villains that they all have, a, you know, the Joker cares far more about the humor and the dark humor that he has and the Riddler cares more about the riddles than he actually does about money. You know, right. the, the money, the crime is this, uh, afterthought. Right, it's yeah. the philosophy. And so these characters have a lot in common with, and there's probably a lot of inspiration taken from sort of characters like the Joker in terms of a guy, like, like any of the characters in Bioshock, because they were really driven by their ideology. And, but their ideology is a mask for their sense of selves, right? You know, this stuff is really, Cohen knows he's a hack, and he doesn't want to ever, you know, he can't admit that to himself, so he has to wrap himself in all this nonsense, because the last thing he could ever do is look in the mirror and say, I'm not much of an artist. No need to thank me for jamming the transmissions of those boors, Atlas and Ryan. Let them have their squabble. The artist, yes, the artist knows there is richer earth to till. From the moment you boot up Bioshock, you can feel the story grab hold of you. A plane crashes at sea, a mysterious lighthouse, a sprawling city beneath the ocean hooking the player from the first touch without overwhelming him with convoluted RPG mechanics was key to the success of the game and the skillful ramping up of Bioshock's legendary gameplay. Bioshock has an amazing opening sequence that I can't imagine the game without it, with uh, you know, the plane and sort of the crash. But I understand that didn't come online until like the very end of development, Sean, is that true? We had a couple of really depressing playtests. We had built all these systems, we thought we were doing a good job of like giving basically people a playground to play with and, and things to do. And when we had a playtest, we, man, we didn't realize how bad of a job we were doing in exposing those systems to the player because we were so in, you know, in these systems and in our own heads, we had no idea that we just weren't facing them towards the player at all. So a after that play test, you know, we, we took a long, cold look at what we were doing and realized that we had to introduce, the, we were confident enough in the systems that they were going to be fun and meaningful to the player, but we really had to think about how we we're going to introduce these systems to the player and in such a way that they understand why the systems were there. Like, you can't ship a README file with the game and expect people to read it. Like, it has to be part of the experience. So the challenge is, how do you introduce people to these systems, but do it in such a way that it fits within the narrative? So we had to integrate all of these things into the story cleanly so that the player felt like it was one, you know, one smooth experience. And I think the Zap'em 
and whack em thing was and one the one of those. Two, and the one-two punch. Yeah, yeah. the one-two punch that came out of that. The plane sequence at the beginning, I, I heard a story that like a programmer put that together in like a day or two, and it was uh, it was a very last minute thing, right? It was, so we had done a focus test, and um, we had had, it was one of the most depressing experiences in my life, because we were very close to being finished, and we, it was basically giving people what essentially became the demo, and people played it, and they, and it was in Boston, and we were sort of behind these glass windows, all these sort of Boston guys, and like, ah, oh, this is a wicked piece of shit. You know, they, they hated it, and they were making fun of it, and they were saying, you know, it's like, it's like watching some guys from Guys and Dolls getting, you know, beating each other up, and this is the stupidest thing they've ever seen. And we thought we were in pretty good shape at that point. And I remember the focus test guy was like sort of, Sort of like a doctor giving me the bad news. You right. know, Sorry, Ken. You better get your fares in order. Right. And um, we went. We all came into work the next day, and we were like, "What are we going to do?" And we we're all pretty depressed. But um, I think we started talking, and as we talked, we started thinking about what are they saying to us? What are these people saying to us? What we think there's something there. Well, how are they missing it? And we decided that there was maybe they didn't understand who they were and who their role in the as a character, who their role in the world was, because. The game at that point started with you in the ocean, right. floating in the ocean after the plane crash. And the crash still had, was in the fiction, it just wouldn't it, show. You just didn't yeah. see it. So you yeah. didn't have the voiceover saying, my parents always said I was going to do great things or whatever that. They didn't show the plane crash. We didn't establish a time period. Because yeah. you know the plane is critical to establishing you're smoking a cigarette. It's very 1960s looking. Um, the, all that stuff was established. It wasn't established. So we decided we had no time and no money and no so we sort of came up with a script. We, you know, we I wrote some lines, our line, I think. Nate, one of our artists, recorded the line. Stephen and Sean and those guys got to work on building this very simple sequence, which was the well, simple, um, straight, relatively simple um, yeah. sequence. And then the plane crash actually happens over the a, the di the uh, Bioshock logo we already had. Yeah. But I sort of wrote, we wrote a radio play behind that with, uh -huh. you know, altitude, altitude of the crash. And that, I think, set the emotional, and the people screaming in terror on the plane crash, that set the emotional tenor much better and explained who the player was. And all of a sudden, we released, then I think the next real encounter we had was people playing the demo, yeah. public encounter, and all of a sudden it was a very different experience. No, I, I remember even back in the day, we did, I think we did a thing on TV where you kind of talked about it, and it was like that night, and I remember that night, like people on the forums were just like going nuts. And even though the game had, I think, had a lot of press attention, when people finally got to play it and go through that sequence, yeah, I just remember there was this mass sort of excitement around it, and then the game shipped only a few weeks after that, right? Or a month after or a, that? Oh, a, few, a week later, or a few days later. It's amazing like now to, to hear that like, literally like a month before the game came out, like the plane sequence came online or something. I mean, it was that late. Right? <laughs> no, no, yeah, well, we saw to go through certification and all yeah, that. Yeah, so, so it's yeah. like within, you it was, know. It wasn't far. It, was, no. it wasn't far. It was really last minute. And it was one of those things where like, you really shouldn't be putting in content that yeah. late. Yeah. But, but we felt that we were so close to having something good that we just rolled the dice on it and um, we worked really hard on it. Like it, yeah. we had, we worked really hard. I remember how much time I spent on just that recorded of altitude. Altitude, I could still hear yeah. the different version of that in my head. We spent so much time on that stuff, and these guys were working on and getting the, uh, the, the animations right and the. The scene <clears throat> was shot in engine, but we decided to pre-render it so that we had to do less QA on it. Right. There oh, was really? no. It wasn't going to be some like weird streaming error or crash error. Wow. It was just like, we're just going to show the video, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, because once you start in the ocean, the, we had this experience of testing a lot with the water effects and how beautiful St Stephen's water effects were. People didn't realize they were out of a cutscene cut at that point. Yeah. And so right. they would just sit there and stare. And then right. they pick up the controller. Yeah. yeah, and they pick up a controller, and all of a sudden they realize they're controlling thing. But, they, but that, yeah, as Sean said, that part of the plane is not actually interactive. It was done in the engine, but we, we just right. filmed it. Now, as you, people were playing through the game and you were testing it, I'm sure... There was debate about, you know, when would you introduce this plasmids, or what would the ramp be? Did that change at all, sort of as you got towards the end of development, about like, oh, we're going to give people the gun at this point, or it's like, we're going to trigger these plasmids at this point? Like, how did that work? So, like, we moved guns around. Like, A, for instance, there was a big debate about, originally you found a gun in the lighthouse, a pistol in the lighthouse. Oh, the very right beginning. there, yeah. And, because it's a shooter, right? Like, yeah. what the hell? And we had a lot of debates about it, and I feel that, it was important that we didn't do that because the fact that you sort of go through a lot of the experience without being having the distraction of a gun is important to getting you immersed in the world because you know when you when you have a 
Uh, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? But you don't have the hammer. So you just sort of had to take in the world and have that feeling of fear. And um, like I know when you saw that splicer bounding around on the ceiling that you couldn't do anything about it. And that had, had even though that's no, Those are those moments, right? Like I remember yes. when I played Unreal for the first time where it's like you're, you're trapped and there's a monster and you can't do it and the lights go out. It's like th that's the moment with the splicer where you're like, I want to do something, but I can't. I can't. And that yep. evokes an emotion. <laughs> I remember we kept, you know, moving machine where the machine gun appeared yeah. around and where various plasmids appeared around. It was a real, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a real fine tuning process. Yeah, and it gave us an opportunity, like especially with the shotgun, to to really present the weapons, like put some space between right. them. It's a I think, moment when you finally. Yeah, I think yeah, like we get Paul, the shotgun Paul sequence. Paul Helquist was yeah. yeah, he put the sequence together for the um, when. You see the shotgun laying in the pool of light. Like every every game developer knows what that means. You know, you know the minute you pick that thing up, something's going to happen. But it was still a very effective way. Is I'm remembering it to. Oh look, I've been waiting for this thing. I'm going to pick it up, and now you have an immediate opportunity to use it. But you know, at the same time, we're trying to ramp up the tension level by having the splicers kind of on the outside of of the light, so you can't really see them, and then coming in one at a time and attacking you. And we had very little, actually very few tools to really control how they, the splicers acted. So how they were set up and how the environment was lit was really important. You know, those well, there's are... even other things like when you get the TK plasmid. I don't think we had a lot of physical space and opportunity and time to really present that. So we came up with the narrative that you know, it was the doctor's office and he used TK to practice tennis. And we had the turret in there that threw tennis balls at you. So if you wanted to, you could catch the tennis balls and throw them, and you can knock things down. I think it revealed uh, pickups that you could then, you know, pull to yourself with TK. But we're always trying to think of like little backstories that we could do. It doesn't have to be as involved as as the shotgun ambush. Sometimes it's just, oh, let's take a grenade turret and turn it into a tennis ball because, turret. Because we <laughs> wanted, yeah, like, and because I, I remember like the impulse was, you know, I've been to dentist office and there's always some like weird aspect of the, the dentist personality they always want to get through their office, you know, yeah. they just have to have their hobby right, featured yeah. in some way. And so we saw an opportunity there to both feature this, he's a tennis nut and teach TK at the same time. And the Rapture is overflowing with memorable locations and set pieces. In developing a world that feels organic, lived in, and functional, a rational managed to create a space that feels perfectly suited to the story and action that takes place in it, which begs a question, did the plot shape the location, or did the plot fit squarely into a world that was already established? Let's talk about some of the areas in Rapture because it, it's an amazing place, but also it, it feels like there's certain areas that are very well designed and that they have, you know, a very certain aesthetic and the characters in there, it all kind of comes together. Ken, do you have a, a part of Rapture that resonates the most with you still to this day? I think the opening is always going to be the most important to me because it's, um, we spent a lot of time there, and it was all for me as a challenge, as a narrative guy, is sort of how do we set up a very complex series of events and a very complex notion and this, all this, you know, Andrew, with so much to tell, Big Daddies and Little Sisters and Andrew Ryan and the time period and, and do that all without cutscenes. And especially, I think, the descent to rapture when you're in that, when you go into the bathosphere. You know, getting that right, getting everything right down to the, you know, the, the, the bathosphere cresting the hill and seeing the city for the first time. Remember how much we worked on the timing of that? Just getting that. And it took us forever to figure out that we should just put the slide projector covering the window. Like, uh -huh. again, in hindsight, it seems like such an obvious choice, but we were really trying to figure out, like, how are we going to tell this story of Ryan and then reveal so you can see the, you know, the city beyond the hill. And also we didn't have to show the whole transition going down yeah. the bottom of the ocean because the whole <laughs> screen was covered. Spoiler alert. I think that's the part that will always be near, near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I mean, for me it was Kashmir. Yeah. Um, that was one of the first... The, re the restaurant at the beginning. Yeah, the restaurant at the beginning because it was really like the first art box that we created that was Rapture. I mean, we created spaces before that weren't really hitting 
the Art Deco look. Scott Sinclair just started, and he he built that uh, design and built that statue of the Atlas with the um, the world on his shoulders. That was in the middle of the room. And uh, Mauricio uh, had done some concept art for us of of that space. And once we started putting everything together and getting it into engine, and actually walking around it and seeing those giant windows off to the side that had that just showed the seascape and really drove home the fact that you're underwater. It was the first time really all the elements started to come together. And we actually were, we had built a bunch of stuff and we actually stepped back and said, we have to just get one room right before we go any further because we weren't getting it right. And so Mauricio did that concept drawing. Yep. We worked really hard on that statue. And that statue, I think, was the first object we really built in the game that yep. was a Bioshock. So we just stayed in that room for like a month until we got it right. And I think the original concept actually had a tram Yes, running through it, it so oh, wow. it was like even more complicated and that was one of those things where we had to keep pulling back and pulling back to really focus on what the bare essence of that room was. Were there parts of Rapture that you never were able to realize that you sort of still the missed? Zoo. The zoo. People we had a zoo frolic, right? that I was excited about. Not everybody was excited about the zoo, but I don't know why I was excited about the zoo because it would have cool. been a nightmare. We had another area that was prior to Arcadia that was more of a straight up uh, agriculture, forest type of area. Before we had the bathyspheres, we had a whole sort of subway transport system in mm -hmm. Rapture, which we spent a lot of time thinking about, and then just realized that these little submersibles would be a much better, much more realistic and much better solution. Are you going to be able to move between locations in that subway system? Yeah, much like much like, much like the um, much like the bathyspheres, but they were much more integrated throughout the space, and we yeah. really want to support them. And we just realized it was not a, it was not, yeah. it was not really relevant to what right. we were doing. Were there certain locations or areas where you knew a certain narrative point, you know, needed to happen? Like you look at, uh, you know, the reveal of sort of Atlas's true motivations. Like was that like, oh, we've got to do it this part, this level, because it fits the story? Or was it more that you sort of like, you had the game laid out in a certain order and you just layered the story on top of it? I think the big one I can think of is that you encounter Ryan in his sort of like, that he would live in an area of industry. Okay. You know, so he lives in this very industrial area because that's where he would feel most comfortable. Uh -huh. um, and that we wanted his, his office, his lair to sort of be not in some, you know, residential zone, but right. where he wants to wake up and smell the grease fires and, you know, and the, and the, and the machines and the smoke. Uh, that's, that's in his lifeblood. Industry is his lifeblood. But it also had to be very theatrical. Like if you look at it right. now, it doesn't look like an office. You kind of know it's an office because it's the story is, is right. telling you that. Set, yeah. um, and we had some old technology that was laying around um, in the game that would control environment settings. So we, old system that we had would cause, let you do high pressure, low pressure, medium pressure. And those would affect lighting and um, other like post-process things in the world. And that was a system that was cut, but because the code was in, we were always trying to figure out ways to use it. And one of the ways that we used it was in the Andrew Ryan sequence, because we didn't have a lot of narrative storytelling tools. We were basically switching the atmosphere to get all the lighting changes. So when, and whenever t a light changes in that scene, we're telling the game that the atmosphere is changing. So And then the preset atmospheres come in and, and shine the spotlights on them or bring up the house lights when we need them to. Because very very early on you could change the pressure in the areas and that would change how explosions work and all this stuff like that. And we just couldn't figure out how to make it gettable it back, for yeah. the player. We couldn't make it feedback, but we still had all those. That, that moved a lot of levers in the game, so we still had the system, so we used it for the sort of theatrical cues of the, you know, very theatrical cues of Ryan appearing, the lights going down where you are and the lights coming up where he, are, uh, where he is, because the engine didn't have those tools by default. The assassin has overcome my final defense, and now he's come to murder me. In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money? Power? No. A man chooses. A slave obeys. And there was a great sense of sort of artistic progression as you went through the game, too, and that, you know, each level had its own sort of voice. Was that something that, you know, a lot of games as they move further in development, it's like, oh, we sort of ran out of time, we can, you know, it's like we're just gonna sort of repeat this and change the color palette. It felt like, I mean, for the team, it was very defined from early on that you wanted each 
each sort of level, which they were levels back in the day, to feel distinct? Yeah, I mean, we had a, we had sort of um, experimented with that back on System Shock 2, back when every Doom level looked pretty much like every other Doom yeah. level, um, because they were just working on the same set of assets. We decided with our very rudimentary tools in System Shock 2 that we would progress with color, yeah. and every deck would feel different from a color standpoint, even though most of that was lighting, not or textures, nothing really more. Yeah. But we had the tools to actually, you know, sort of theme levels. I think a lot of this goes back to, I think my first memory was actually from when I was one years old at the Montreal World um, Expo. World you remember Fair. when you were one? I, well, I remember being at something at this World's Fair, which I didn't realize I think was in 1967 when okay. I was one years old, uh -huh. a little over one years old. Wow. And I was on a theme park ride they had with a, and I remember being at this thing where a big bat flies out of this sort of thing and comes up. I don't know why I was a one-year-old was on this ride. I'm not sure. It's sort of a haunted housey kind of ride. And I, I remember loving it. And I think that stuck with me. So the notion of sort of theme parky themes and settings, um, and Disney World does a great job with this. You can go to Disney World. They theme areas. So themed areas are something that always resonated with me. And Bioshock sort of always has had this notion of feeling of theme in different areas, much more than the real world has. Like you walk from building to building most them, you can't really tell them apart. You right, walk from there, a, yeah. yeah yes. You know, walk from a floor of an office building to another floor. It's not going to look any different. But we, we always felt that was really important. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, if you look at Swap Four, so some early experiments with this, especially like the serial killer's house level in Swap Four, um, which is probably one of the most dense levels that we ship. But you were trying to tell a specific story with that, and. Going straight into Bioshock and using the same exact engine that we're using, and we were very comfortable at that point with how the engine worked and how to art up these rooms, gave us a leg up when we sat down and really thought about what stories are we specifically trying to tell. And one of the one of my favorite anecdotes from this time period is um, with Sander Cohen. I think it was Nate Wells and Stephen Alexander sat down one night, and they came up with a backstory for every dead body that you find. In that, in that space, and then they told that story with the props that they could. Even if it was just like, this guy crawled three feet and then shot himself in the head because he was sad about something, you know, they put those marks in, maybe put a picture next to the guy, and then he shot himself. So they, they really, like, did their homework and tried to add, you know, the backstory for everything that you're going to find in that space. I've got Atlas's cones hitting us nonstop and two dead mechanics just this week. We need to control costs. If I wanted to deal with amateurs, I would have stayed on dry land. Iconic and haunting, the Big Daddy and Little Sisters of Bioshock immediately captivated the public's imagination. Big Daddy encounters defined the Bioshock experience, creating new mechanics and techniques that had not been seen before in gaming. So Big Daddy, Little Sister, such an iconic moment or series of moments in this game. I'm, I'm fascinated about how that got layered in because we talked a lot about the setting and the tone. That is still to me, you know, a mechanic that I remember was there unique about, you know, choosing to engage the Big Daddy and being a fight that you know is going to be very aggressive and different than a you know, traditional boss fight. I know you had an idea, Ken, of sort of three different types of AIs interacting in the same world. Yeah, we were sort of like, trying to, I was trying to think of like AIs you hadn't seen before. And this was still pretty early, like like 10 years ago, a lot's changed in 10 years. So like AIs were still pretty much enemies who saw you and came after you. Zigzag, shoot. Yep, and then that was really the focus is how you make them, you know, AI better at you, you know, where so I started thinking about other more primal behaviors to think about. And I was watching a nature show one day, you know, these typical nature shows. And it's like the, watch the, observe the mother tiger taking care of her young, you know, one of those kind of things. And I realized that we don't even need a narrator on those shows. We understand certain behaviors just by looking at them. They're very primal, like somebody protecting their young, the predator-prey behavior. Those things were very, you don't need dialogue for that. And AIs at that point, we didn't have the ability to do a lot of sort of, you know, smart AI. Yeah. So I said, well, what if their behaviors are just very primal and we can, we can model those behaviors? So aggro rules is something we knew we can model, right? You know. How does, an, how does an AI aggro on you? What are the rules for that? Could they make a uh, aggression display um, rather than just attack? 
and um, and can another character appear afraid and, and hide behind the skirts of another character? And we started talking about these things, and the Big Daddy became very quickly, the actual form of the Big Daddy became yeah. very quickly as sort of this protector creature. The Little Sister took a lot longer, ironically, even though it's a much simpler notion in a lot of ways. The initial idea came out of sort of watching a nature show and we're trying to work within our constraints of making, we didn't have, we couldn't make super complex AIs. Is when we first got the system up and running. This is before the, the play test. We weren't really thinking about player facing these things. And we had this entire system set up that completely simulated what would happen. And you'd play through the vertical slice and you walk into a room and everybody's dead because the system would work perfectly. And right. You weren't, the big you weren't there to see the fight. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we track all the, well, they weren't called Little Sisters at the time, but we track how much they were harvesting. And it was all like a command and conquer level simulation. Yeah. Yeah. And players didn't care or notice yep. and yeah. so we just abandon all that stuff yeah so that that took us a step towards you know how do we present this to the player then how do we make the the gatherers which were we called them at the time before the little sister design came on like how do we make them empathetic towards the player how do we make the player want to engage with that because at the time they were just slugs right so which is a That's horrible right, design originally were slugs right yeah actually which is a horrible design in so many ways because you don't care about slugs right. and they're also on the ground so you don't see yes, them yeah. they're not like at eye level and they're dark so but it you was, still have yeah. something we have some of the, the trailer had like the same or not the trailer the demo our prototype we did so it had the big daddy sort of like interacting with the little yeah. slug uh, and well, slugs crawl around the big daddy or no, it's, no just, yeah. it's, it's this awful That's little, little mesh right. it. yeah. it's like a little beetle sort of uh -huh. yeah it, would, it was terrible yeah and they were protecting <laughs> and they the, had um, protecting the beetles the beetles what and, really? the, and, and, and the big daddy so had two drills it's, they didn't have a hand, so they could, there's no way they could, right. like, mm, It's just you know. fascinating to me because, like, the little sister, it's like there's such humanity in it, which really, you really connect with. You which would, seems like, like you would think that would be the, the obvious straight thing, straight yeah. 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 We're not very smart. <laughs> the, the idea of sort of choosing to engage the Big Daddy, I mean, when I was, first time I played the game, I mean, that was always profound to me because you sort of sit there and, like, am I ready for this? And your choice to sort of, like, you know, the kind of opposite of stealth, like, when you want to be discovered, was that always the mechanic with the Big Daddy? Yeah, that, that was, yeah. The, the idea was that they would have very particular rules about engaging with you that were entirely dependent on how you, the threat level towards, not them, towards the, the creature they were protecting. Yeah, that was set, and then as you worked through it, I'm sure there were conversations about how difficult do we make these fights and sort of the, the balancing of that, and even, you know, with the game, you, you don't start off with a Big Daddy fight. It's a little ways into the game until you actually get to that. So was that, that was your debate. You well. actually encounter the notion of Big Daddy and Little Sister many times before you actually are freed into an arena where you can actually fight them. Yeah. You see them. Sneaking you, out, yeah, pipes. Yeah. You go, you're going, you see them, you see, you see them walking down a hall. You see, well, the first time you see Little Sister, she's harvesting, and then you see the Big Daddy come and protect her. And we realized it was, it was four or five sequences we had to do to set up set the stage for these characters and look we were hoping they'd be iconic and people would respond to the way they did because we certainly spent energy on them with the expectation that they'd have an impact that we really just as easily could have turned out that nobody gave nobody I cared. I think the actual very first time and not a lot of people see it there's a little sister in the vent in Kashmir restaurant uh -huh. But if you're looking in the right direction at the right time, you'll see her looking at you, and then she'll disappear. It's just a pair of eyes. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's the actual mesh. Is it the mesh? Because it was easier to do that right. than the <laughs> eyes, but yeah. No, 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 no. Thank you. The path of the righteous is not always easy. The thing as you play through the game, uh, you know, I think the moments with those sort of encounters certainly stand out to the, um, to the player. For you guys, as you were developing it, was there a debate about how often to sort of have those encounters? Like, you know, like how many Big Daddies would there be? How would that play out? I mean, was that something that sort of changed as you 
No, I think we no. decided there would be three. I think it was three per yeah. level. So three and two in smaller levels. We did have a third Big Daddy that was mostly finished, but we we couldn't make it fun. Like that last 10% of an AI is always like, uh -huh. where's the fun? Like, you how do you really make it, they it put fun? It I think they put it into Bioshock 2, didn't they? They might have, yeah. They might have, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it was fully rigged, fully animated, but it's, we just didn't have the the time we needed to really, really polish it, so right. we ended up shipping with the, the Bouncer and uh, Rosie. Hunting the Big Daddy, that demo was a, a huge moment, I think, in the game's kind of marketing campaign. Um, and that really, I think, you know, sold the, the tension of that, that battle. When you showed that, did the entire game feel like that, or was that really more of just like a vertical slice of what you wanted the game to feel like? That, at that point, was more what we wanted to feel like, because the Big Daddy was still had a lot of problems at that point. Um, but we were confident we could do that. Like we want to make sure we were, that was something, an experience we could deliver on. And there were it was like it functioned, but it would do really weird things. Like it had this tendency at the time to, if you did the wrong thing, that it would turn into basically a super ball and start like a tiny little super ball. Uh -huh. The big daddy would go, whoop, turn to a super ball and start bouncing or off off the, the ceiling and walls like a million miles an hour. We didn't, uh -huh. I don't, do you remember why you did that or what I was going sure on? I'm sure it was some physics bug that we were, yeah. And, and so that actually happened sometimes we were doing the demo and Joe uh, Falstick, who was the guy running the demo with me in Barcelona, was very good at making sure that he turned away from right. the big daddy. Like, oh yeah, I guess we killed the big daddy. He must be dying <laughs> over there. But so it, they were, all things were functional, but they, were, they weren't really, they didn't have all their bells and whistles on yet. It was really good for us because it sort of gave us some confidence that people would respond to just the notion of you know, watching Little Sister and biding your time and choosing your moment. Well, it gave us confidence, but it also gave us a tool that the development team as a whole could gather around and say, we want to make it like this. Like, yes, a lot of elements in that demo were scripted, but they provided a framework for us to go back and how do we make that so it's not scripted? How do we make this robust enough so that the player can actually use these systems? Yep. So it was something that we could point to and say, you know, all right, how are we going to do this? Like, well, let's break it down and let's, let's figure it out. And that was like in September and actually we were, the game was done in... The game was done in February, March, so we weren't that far off. Yeah. We were the, a lot went into it in, in, in those final months. Um, but it was a big confidence boost for us because we thought it was the most important thing about the game, besides the world, was this sort of big daddy little sister concept. And if people didn't care about it, it would have been a problem for us because we spent a lot of time on it. Kill, <coughs> uh, excuse me, to harvest or not to harvest, the moral dilemma that follows you throughout the Bioshock experience and defines the fate of the player. This choice lays at the center of your Bioshock story and has repercussions that can be felt in nearly every facet of the gameplay. Part of Bioshock's lasting legacy, of course, are the Little Sisters and this moral choice that presented itself to the player. Uh, you know, everyone became a water cooler conversation about like, well, did you save them? Did you harvest them? That concept, Ken, was that something that came about early in development or uh, that, that binary choice? When did that come into the game? When did, I don't remember when. I mean, we had the concept of, 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 of them being protected, but I can't remember when yeah, you actually certainly chose. wasn't. When there were slugs, it was not meaningful. I think there was... Um, do you salt it? Do you not yeah, salt yeah. it? Yeah. There were resources that you could get, but it, there was no choice there, right? It was The choice was, do I want to fight the Big Daddy or not? Yeah. I think once we got into the realm of they have to be empathetic, the player has to have some feeling towards them, which you're not going to get from slugs, right. then we start seeing that opportunity there of like, okay, nobody's going to want to do harm to these people girls or do they like and do we allow them to it was a yeah we weren't comfortable with it at first when it, well, when it first well, came up that we could uh i think it was important that we were that it was a way to reflect the sort of larger economic questions of a, of a world like rapture where like you know where the economy drives everything are there you know where are there any limits to economic decision making versus moral decision making because that's sort of what you you know the randian notion is that it's not the role that you don't sort of legislate morality. 
let's try to take that to an extreme and see where that ends up. And the Little Sisters sort of became that. And in this world, they became a commodity. And the question we have for the players, are you willing, you know, they're a commodity to you as well, potentially, or are you want to participate in the commodification? There was, I think, a fair amount of nervousness internally at the publisher about it for a little while, but pretty quickly they were able to sort of say, look, we, we trust you guys and go, you know, do this. And I only had a few, the press, and this sort of happens over and over again, the games press worried a ton about it and like would wring their hands about it. They ever recognized it was a setting topic but that it was done to a larger purpose. That it wasn't just sort of like, hey, let's, this is the game where you kill children. And well, I remember that was a sensitivity. I know that like you guys wanted to call them little sisters, not little girls. And it was sort of, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't killing them. It was harvesting them. And I mean, you, you did some things probably on purpose, right? To sort of explain that this, you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't doing anything vicious to them, right? Well, I mean, you are, you, you do sort of, they do sort of disappear out of you and a big slug out of their belly yeah. you know comes up that you well, well we didn't want that to be graphic we wanted it to right. be very clear yeah. that you work that you were that wasn't yeah, right. yeah. yeah but it was not it was not intended to be a, a prurient in right. terms of hey let's you know this is a simulation of, of pulling a sea slug out of a little girl's belly but we wanted you to understand the, the, that you were making a very diabolical more pact moral economic pact there and we think that came across, and I think it came across well enough, and the, I think the test of how well it came across is, I think most people didn't really th thought of it as a, am I willing to do this thing or not? Right. And I, people would tell us stories how like their girlfriend saw them harvesting and then they, they literally slept on the couch that night. Right. And, and that's, you know, that's an interesting, uh, you know, that was, that was interesting how people connected to a 3D mesh that's really no different than any other 3D mesh in the world. Like yeah. this little, little sister, she's not a person. She's a 3D asset, a virtual 3D asset, right? That has a voice actor connected to it who's an adult woman. And nobody was actually getting harmed, but right. people still emotionally connected to them and made and, and made an emotional connection. And also, you know, I think when you're playing, you don't really know what the impact of that choice is. Yes. And that's sort of the, you know, the, the curiosity of like, well, you know, you're a gamer, so it's like, am I gonna game the system? Which one should I pick? How does this impact things? As you go through the game, it's never, never really fully clear what that choice is going to lead to, right? And the, the ambiguousness of that was something you wanted to sort of create mystery around throughout the game? Yeah, I mean, we went back and forth a lot about what the rewards for harvesting versus saving would be. And actually, I think we should have really pushed further that the rewards for saving were much more, much more, should have been much more meager than the rewards for harvesting, just uh -huh. to really sort of put you up against the wall, push you up against the wall and say, yeah. you know, are you going to stick by your moral guns here? Because you're going to pay for it. Because yeah. that's usually the way life is, right? Yep. It's always harder to take a moral path than it is to take an amoral path. Um, but there's incentives to take amoral paths because it's the easier path. <laughs> As you play through the game, eventually you get to the ending, and um, as we know now, there were sort of two endings that uh, you know were affected by that choice, um, and that was something at the time. I know you said publicly that you weren't in favor of sort of having two endings. Was that in part because you know the game is about not having choice, or did you think that you know the two endings were? I don't know, like I, I'm interested for narratively, like why you didn't want to go that path. It seemed forced, given that the game really sort of almost made a joke, I mean a meta commentary joke about the lack of agency in right. games, the lack of meaning of those choices given that the, you have these two endings. I guess you could make an argument that, well, you were free, you were given choice of the, you know, when once Ryan's dead, and that's really what it's about. But it, I think we also had, didn't really have enough time to, um, to execute on those Super Bowl. I was pretty happy with how the the happier one came out, you know, with the, the sort of little sister focus, but it's a much more subtle story than I would have time to tell about you, sort of your slow descent into, you know, moral chaos and, right. and, and, and dissolute living and all the things that sort of come along with a life that is sort of separate from a moral structure. It's a long story. And so, I mean, you were just, you were just switching a cutscene. It wasn't like you were doing sort of no. a whole other level that was different no. or something. So the choice was... There's two cutscenes with very tight time and or economic Or just start a nuclear war. Yes. 
And that's not, you know, You're that's, a nice guy or you start a nuclear yeah, war. Yeah, and, and because we had so many problems on our plate, that was something I had to sort of do in the spare time. So I was pretty happy with one, but not very happy with the other. I know you had said publicly before that there was a, another sort of more ambiguous ending that you had originally planned, or what, what would you have done? Uh, th there was a notion of an ambiguous setting in which if I, had, if I just wrote one, I would have found a way that would just talk about the moral ambiguity of the world rather than the sort of, you know, positive or negative because it is such a, look, I, I think we really tried with Bioshock not to sort of make a game about good, pe evil, good and evil. It was really about uh, circumstances and what circumstances lead people to. Right. and how they delude themselves with ideology to do things that they would think are evil, but it's okay because it's for the good cause. Right. And um, that's, a, that's what I probably would have, if I just had one to write, I'd probably focus more on that, is, you know, how, how difficult it is to sort of align, to, when, when, I, when you start being driven by ideology rather than being in the moment and thinking about the impact of what you're doing. Right. Sean, I, you talked to gamers, I'm sure, over the years. Did you ever get a sense of how people harvested versus saved, and what was there any sort of data? I mean, this is before the days where you get telemetry and data on like what people picked and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, but. anecdotally, it seems like more people saving little sisters. Oh, although, I, yeah, I have a few friends that were, you know, I just harvested every single one. I wanted to see what happened. So, I, mean, I don't know if that was more, you know, the game developer and them trying to see, you know, what what would right. happen. But certainly, for the most part, I, I think most people. Which I guess is a good thing. It means that maybe people are good at heart. You know, they, right. they kind of feel bad. And they want to, they they want to save the little sisters. So, yeah, I'll say it. You know, the needle sways towards the green there. Time for Betty Bye, Mr. B. Hurry, hurry, Mr. Bubbles. The illusion of choice is a thinly veiled dynamic that drives many single player gaming experiences. And while many developers spend a lot of time trying to convince players that choice is real and authentic in their games, the truth more often is that choice is a superficial concept in gaming narrative. Bioshock confronted this idea head on, searing into our minds a innocuous three word phrase with an unforgettable new meaning. Would you kindly? Of course, one of the most memorable moments in the game is the "Would you kindly" phrase and the reveal of uh, you know how that's been motivating the player throughout the entire game. Uh, it's still, to me, one of the you know most classic kind of narrative moments in games in the past decade. What's interesting about that phrase is that it, it didn't always start like that. Can you tell us sort of about the evolution of sort of the you know the conditioning of the player and there was once "Excelsior" was the phrase once. Yeah, this is. <laughs> I'm trying to recall um, some of this. So I, we had the idea, like, because we had the Andrew Ryan scene very early, and we knew sort of all the events that would happen. There were phrases before there was would you kindly, the notion existed and what it meant and what it was, but we didn't actually have the phrase would you kindly until later, so we had a bunch of terms we threw in there. Cause, and like Excelsior was it for one point, that's probably comes from my, my Stan Lee fanboyism. Was that like so throughout the game, it would have been like Excelsior? Just randomly there, say There that. are some things when you're making games you just sort of throw in as like, we need Sounds something. Cool we need something. head over there, Excelsior. And then it sits there for yeah. a year. Right. And then all of a sudden, you kind of forget it's not good, right? right. And then yeah. <laughs> until somebody comes along and says, "Dude, seriously, yeah." What, or you Excelsior? meant it to be like a stub in. You never right. meant yeah. it to actually gain traction, and then you're like, "Oh crap!" But that sense of of some phrase or word being repeated throughout the game that you wouldn't really realize its meaning yes. um, until later. That was there very early on. Yes. Yeah. And the fact that you would have something that seemed like a non-thing and then came back at you like a freight train later on was always that was there from pretty early. Sit. Would you kindly? Stand. Would you kindly? Run. Stop. Turn. A man chooses. A slave obeys. So that phrase evolved, but talk about that, you know, the sort of meta-narrative of, you know, being in a game, thinking that you have a sense of choice and making these decisions, but then obviously realizing that the, you know, the player ultimately didn't have choice or was conditioned in a way that they would react to that. Um, that was, you know, sort of a, 
sort of a new idea for a game. Where did that come from on your side, Ken? I mean, was, was there sort of a deeper sort of uh, you know meaning behind it? No, look, I, I think I was always interested in the concept. You know, whether it's you know Oedipus, not to get too pointy-headed here, but Oedipus sort of thinking he has, oh, I'm going to leave you know this city and go to another city because there's been this prophecy about me and I'm going to avoid my fate and I'm in complete control and then finding out he's not in control at all to the Manchurian candidate which is a story I love about it's, you know somebody who who you find out is just a puppet you know living a life of a man and fight club you know I always love those kind of stories about who am I and what is my agency in this world because look we struggle I think everybody struggles that you know how much how much we really have control over and how much is you know our boss or parents or whatever are telling us what to do. So uh, that seemed like a natural thing for a story and because it came from movies, that idea a lot and plays, yeah. I, I don't think it, it was very, there was a lot of, it hadn't been explored in games really and yeah. games are particularly interesting because games. Because you feel like you, do, you are agency, interacting yeah. with us, yeah. And you're really being, you know, most games, especially at the time, you're really just being railroaded okay. down a corridor. It's very easy to underestimate gamers and I think probably I did a little of my own underestimation there that they would it would be a little too pointy-headed for people, but people seem to really engage, because probably because it spoke to an experience they had, a struggle as a gamer they've always had, which is like, I want to control, but how much control do I really have in this game? Uh -huh. True. And, Sean, I mean, it was also something that, you know, was a great surprise when you played through the game, and I'm sure even for people on the team, did everyone know that when Ken was sort of doing it, or did it was revealed as people played through it? I think, I mean, at some point, the, the entire team knew uh, it wasn't, um, it was something that was talked about uh, with a smaller group before, you know, it was bought to the entire team. Early on when you, when you heard the idea and you, you just kind of clicks, right? You're like, okay, like I totally get this. Did like, people get it? I seem to remember a few people looking at me like I was, I was like a luna, lunatic. Not, maybe not the specifics and maybe it's the Excelsior, or maybe you're talking about the Excelsior yeah, yeah, time, yeah. but the idea that you don't really have choice and exactly like you said, you, you played through how many video games and Everybody's game is going to end the same way. You're going to kill these people. You're going to pass through these checkpoints, and you think you have a choice, but the only real choice is to stop playing the game. So the the idea that we're kind of like taking that on resonated. Now the actual like, is it Excelsior or is it the Latin phrase I forgot, or if it's would you kindly? See, here's how I remember it, and I could be you know. I could I could be wrong. Yeah. I could remember being so surprised by the outside reaction because I remember the internal reaction being completely. Nobody connected or engaged to it. I mean, we worked on it. Yeah. And, and so I was kind of surprised by the outside reaction because I kind of thought it was like, you know, as I said, it's a bit academic, right? Yeah. And and it, well, it could also be a function of we're playing well, it close to the vest. I could I could be misremembering it, or it could also just be a function of nobody making the game had the experience of playing it through right. and getting to that so moment. They, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean like it was revealed you're... to them in advance of really playing it, yeah. so it wasn't that surprise. Yeah, they had seen it in all its really half-assed, you know, development well, stages and, and along the way. out of order. Yeah, out of order and all that. And it's not really something you can play test over an afternoon, because it takes a little while to get to that point. You, la you need to lack the knowledge about yeah. what the game is to be able to sort of have that um, experience all the way through. I know you guys have talked about uh, you know the idea of Atlas, the you know the voice actor changing, and it was I guess very important that the you nailed that actor right, and, and you trusted that actor until there was sort of the re the Fontaine reveal and sort of understanding that. Yeah, trust was everything there, right? And so there was something about either the actor or the writing or the accent that just m people immediately said this guy's no good. Right. When the, the first Atlas we had, because you have to trust this guy, and at least if you know, there's no trust. There's no, you know, there's no punch in the gut. I think we've really focused on making him have personal stakes in the story as well. That he had his family trapped. Even of course, it was all fiction, right? But his fan, he had, he had, he had skin in the game. He, you know, he sort of spoke to you as a friend, and especially because the whole world was so hostile to you. I think it took a while to get that exactly right. Listen, I've got a family. I need to get them out of here. But the Splicers have cut me off from them. If you can reach them in Neptune's bounty, then maybe, just maybe, I know you must feel like the unluckiest man in the world right now, but you're the only hope I'll ever see my wife and child again. Sean, what do you hope is the kind of lasting legacy of Bioshock? You know, 10 years hence, a lot of things you guys were doing, uh, you know, or have sort of been become common now, right, with, you know, upgrades and moral choices and games yeah. and whatnot, but it was really pioneering work. 
um, a decade ago. When you reflect on it, what do, you, what do you hope people remember the game for sort of pushing forward? For me, it's, it's telling a story with the medium and how we used everything available to us to tell that story. Um, we used the environment to set up the backstory of Rapture and really create a sense of space which I think is vitally important to getting the players to trust that, you know, to sit down and kind of like just be in the space and, and let these things happen. You know, even, uh, even the radio logs, uh, the rudimentary animation that we had at the time, I mean, we really sat down with the tools that we had and at our disposal and tried to tell a meaningful story. I mean, not meaningful, but something that would be memorable to people that they could take away and, like you said earlier, have that water cooler moment where they're excited enough to, to talk about it after they put the controller down. So for me, I, I think the legacy is that um, it was a story well told. For me, it was a sense of place, being like the rapture is a real thing, even though it's not. You know, it's actually a very crude, you know, the, from the time, you know, we're always a big crude bunch of polygons and texture maps. Yeah. You know, it's only, the original game is only in 720, I think. And I played a lot of it when we were testing it on a 14-inch, on like, you know, uh, SD television. That it still felt like a sense of place in the music and the, and the characters. That it's a real place. And I think that my memories of the Bioshock games is that I take away that Rapture's a real place and Elizabeth's a real person. Those are the two sort of big things that stick with me with those two games. And that's sort of what I'll always, you know, carry forward with me in my life. Bioshock is, you know, it's a place, but as we saw with Infinite, I mean, it's an idea and it's a sort of a type of game. I think a lot of people say like, oh, this is a, you know, a type of experience. Um, when you think about, you know, your career, where you guys want to go, I mean, do you, that idea of those types of games, do you miss it now that you've sort of moved on to other things now? Or do you feel like it's sort of, you've closed that chapter? I mean, it's always a part of what you do. Like, System Shock 2 was a part of Bioshock, there were, but it, it wasn't System Shock 2. It was, it was a gro you know, you're growing past that and trying out new things. I, I think Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite and even going back to Swap 4, those will always be a part of my experience as a game developer and, and what we're trying to do with the medium. So I don't think it's something that you just draw a line and say, you know, we'll never return because there's always lessons that you can learn and things that you bring with you to the, to the next project that you're working on. I don't think the new game is going to, like, people are, like, are not going to be surprised that it's a, this game is a new game from us. They're going to see a lot of what we had done in, before in terms of world building and aspects of storytelling. Um, the goal is to sort of, you know, move away from the you really have no choice kind of, kind of thing. And that's a very, 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 very hard problem which we spent years working on. But we're building upon a foundation of stuff we've done before, um, just trying to go in a different direction with it. But, it's, it's, it's always going to be part of our DNA. A city where the artist would not fear the sense, where the scientist would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well.